Matthew chapter 11. We've been using Sunday nights to equip us to reach our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I personally believe that the New Testament letters to the churches call believers in Christ to live out the gospel among the world in order to glorify God and draw people to Him. Um, the, church, the letters really emphasize that. Uh, what are you doing in your practical life, in your workplace, in your family to glorify God by the way that you live, by the way that you live out the reality that you are a child of God? Um, and how, does that, how is God using that, that joy to be, just be a child of God? Uh, to draw people to himself. In other words, as you boldly live the Christian life among lost sinners, God will give you opportunities to share the gospel to lost sinners if you want those opportunities. Um, If you're you're rejoicing in Jesus, you'll be a lot more motivated uh, to tell somebody about him, and they'll be probably more apt to listen because you might have a smile on your face. So the question is, do you want those opportunities? Are you rejoicing in Jesus Are you ready to move conversations along? We've been talking about that, reaching a world, moving conversations from um, casual, right, to spiritual, to gospel conversations. Are you ready to present your Christ story, your testimony of repentance and faith in Jesus Christ and what Christ has done in your life? And are you ready to preach or proclaim the Christ story, to point people to the fact that Christ died for their sins and he was buried and he rose again the third day? Are you prepared to share the gospel? And we've been focusing in on what would happen if someone that I'm sharing the gospel with has a roadblock in front of them that keeps them from believing it. Are you prepared to work to remove that roadblock? Do you have the tools to remove it? Do you know where to find those tools? Okay, We're trying to introduce you to such tools. So we want people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and many people in our society struggle with the claims of Jesus about himself. And many people in our society struggle with the claims that Jesus has upon their life as his creatures. Many people just need a little help to remove roadblocks, right? Yeah, you ever seen? There's a difference between we saw the we're at the parade last night, and the police have these barricades that are a lot pretty easy to remove. Move, you know, a guy can just pick them up and remove. Have you ever seen the, the difference between a barricade like that and one of those big old concrete barricades? Ah, you might need a little help. You might need a bulldozer. And some roadblocks for people. Sometimes you're like, yeah, I can help move that. Other times you're like, I need some help. <laughs> I'm going to need some heavy equipment or someone who who's, has more familiarity with this topic to help me with this. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to help you realize, you know what, there's some roadblocks that people have that, are, you know, if I just think about it and pray about it and long enough, I can help them move that. There's other roadblocks that are like, <laughs> yeah, help! All right, so we're trying to give you some of that help and trying to help you see um, how you can have that help. We've been looking at the reliability of the Bible, and we're doing that for the seeker's sake, for the doubter's sake. We want to help them, but also for our own sake, because we want confidence. We want to have the confidence that what we believe is the truth. And what's more than that, Christ wants us to be confident. Do you know that? Christ wants you to be confident. He wants us to joyfully labor, to convince the world that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Because he's our way, our truth, and our life. Not not in the sense like the world, well, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Not that way, but the fact that he said, I'm the way, the truth, the life. And because we believe that, made it personal, we joyfully say, he's the way. He's the truth, he's the life. I've experienced it. Christ wants us to be confident of who he is and what he claims for ourselves and for the world. So I have you in Matthew 11 because... It opens up with the account of when a preacher of Christ was doubting. Now, this is John the Baptist, and what a preacher he was. What a prophet. You know, can you imagine if I showed up in camel skin with a grasshopper in my beard next week, you know? But he was quite a... (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Okay, all right. Um, He was quite a prophet. In fact, Jesus' own words about John in this chapter, verse 11, he said, Verily I say unto you, among among them that are born of women... There hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. I mean, that is a high honor of a man coming from the mouth of his creator. Yet, in Matthew 11, John was in prison, beginning of the chapter, and John was going to die soon enough. 
John was doubting that Jesus was the Christ. Now, if I publicly stated, I'm having my doubts that Jesus was the Son of God, I'd be fired. <laughs> I, I mean, that's probably, that's probably how it would go. You get up on a Sunday morning, morning, folks, I just need to tell you today, I'm having my doubts. <laughs> You'd be like, cancel the service or get that guy out of here. That's how it would go. But here was the forerunner of the Christ in a low time in his life, doubting that the Christ was actually the Christ. So he acted on the doubt, though. See, he acted on the doubt. He didn't send to the Pharisees and Sadducees to help him with his doubt. He didn't send to the enemies of Christ to help him with his doubt. Well, let me get answers about whether or not he's the Christ. Let me go talk to the people that hate him, who are obviously corrupt. He didn't do that. It doesn't make any sense to go to people who hate God and are obviously corrupt and obviously biased against God when you have doubts and questions. It doesn't make sense to go read books written by such arrogant atheists like Richard Dawkins when you're starting to have doubts. You're like, I want to look him up. Well, you can, but he's, he's just a mean guy. And he writes very angrily toward Christ and Christians. It doesn't make sense to go to someone like that who obviously has a bias against Jesus. What should you do? You should go directly to the source. Go to Jesus with your doubts. Go to Jesus with your questions. John sent to Jesus, verse 2, it said he sent two of his disciples when he heard from prison the works of Christ. And he sent two of his students to Jesus to ask him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Are you the one that was supposed to come, the Messiah, or are we looking for someone, someone else? Now, a couple of facts here I want to point out. One, Jesus did not bash John for his doubts. He did not say, John, you're pathetic. Of course I'm the Christ. <laughs> Believe, right? He didn't do that, no. And the other part of this, Jesus was the Messiah whether John believed it or not. From this point, John likely did not get out of prison, would likely never get the opportunity to see Jesus for himself, right? But Jesus was who he said he was whether John believed or not. See, Jesus was proclaiming the kingdom of God according to this record. He was doing miracles. He was forgiving sins. He was anointed by the Spirit of God. And he was who he was whether John or anyone else believed or not. And yet, he offered evidence to send back to John that would support the claim that he was Christ. Look at verse 4. He answered and said to them, Go and show John again. Those things which you do hear and see. Go back to John, tell him what you're hearing, tell him what you're seeing. What were they hearing and seeing? Verse 5, the blind receive their sight. The lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor of the gospel preach to them. Number one, just what they're hearing and seeing is incredible, it's amazing. Number two, it points, Jesus was pointing him back to what the Old Testament scriptures said about what the Messiah would come and do. So not only was it, he pointing to evidence in real time that he was the Christ, this was evidence that prophets of God from hundreds of years ago said that, that Jesus would do these things. He's giving him real, visible, physical evidence that even spans centuries from prophecy to fulfillment that he was the Messiah. He gave him that evidence, miracles and real time that supported the claim that he was Christ. Now, John did not get to see those miracles. So we're, you know, we're kind of like John in that way, okay? Because we live today, <laughs> not in that time. So we're kind of like John. John was still in prison. Here's what he would have to do if he was going to continue with faith he would have to take those two students at their word. They were going to come with a report from Jesus to John. You've seen what I've done, tell John. And he would have to take his students, whom he trusted, at their word. That's kind of like us, right? But the, 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 bare, the, the basic level of being a Christian is taking the people who saw what Jesus said and did, taking them at their word. Right? That's it. That's the basic understanding of faith in the gospel, faith in Christianity. We believe God because of the words we have that they recorded. Okay? 
So the claim that Jesus was Christ was true. It stood on its own two feet just as sure as Jesus was standing on his own two feet right there. There he was. Like it or not, Jesus is a real person. Jesus really existed on earth. Now he's in heaven, but he, he was on earth and he did these things and you got to do something with that. Christianity make a, made a big splash in the ocean of the world and the ripple effects are still coming. The tsunamis are still hitting the banks. Are you with me? Something happened in the first century in Israel. Okay. And yet, as true as it was that Jesus was the truth, standing on his own two feet, Jesus was willing to back up that claim, a claim John had his doubts about, and he backed it up with visible, visible evidence, and then he called John to have faith. Look at verse 6. Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. What was he saying? John, you're at a low point, but if you don't get tripped up, offended means like, not like, oh, you hurt my feelings. Okay, this more means like you got tripped up. You stumbled in your faith. Low times in life are like we've stumbled. It's like, remember, I've fallen and I can't get up. Who remembers that, right? <laughs> That's right. Right, we feel that way sometimes. But Jesus is like, blessed is a guy who doesn't stay fallen and, and doesn't get up. Blessed is the man who doesn't stay down when he stumbles. He gets up. He dusts off. He continues to believe Jesus is the Christ. He continues to follow Jesus. Yes, he has his doubts, but he goes to Jesus with them. He goes to Jesus and he gets evidence that points him to the truth of Jesus. And he keeps on keeping on. Jesus said, that man is blessed. This is a promise from Jesus himself. Come to me. Come to me. Believe in me. Follow me. I will bless you. He promised that. This is something you can experience personally. Blessed because he believes Jesus Christ. Blessed because he grows in confidence through the evidence that supports that claim. And he can rest oh, if he chooses, even in a prison cell, on the evidential reports that point to the fact that Jesus is the truth. He can keep believing and following Jesus Christ even at his lowest points in life. So what does this mean for us and how does this tie into tonight's topic of archaeological evidence? Well, there's one of, one of two sides here, okay? So here's the roadblocks that keep people from becoming a faith. Let's say you are a, a genuine believer in Jesus Christ and you are on the faith side of a roadblock. What does that mean? You've already believed the gospel of Jesus because of its power to convince you it is true. Like you're living in the reality of the gospel and you enjoy it right and it's real not because you feel like it is real but, but it's, it's real and you have Jesus and you interact other, with others who have roadblocks and you look back on the other side of the Christian reality the truth and you're like well I, I see that roadblock and I may not be sure what to do about that roadblock but I know this is true are, are you with me is this making sense all right, so you have your doubts from time to time. Maybe you even have your doubts about serious matters of faith in Jesus and the Bible because of the, the culture. You, you would have never doubted it if it wasn't for the stinking culture and people that you're called to reach. And th so then you go to try to obey Jesus and reach them. And then you run into these things because you're being obedient. And you're like, Jesus, what's the problem? I'm trying to obey you and I'm running these questions. Because, are you with me? Are you with me? Like if we're going to take an active part in reaching others with the gospel, we're going to run into stuff like this. And, and, and what do we do with it? Go to Jesus, go to Jesus. So my point is God wants you to keep living by faith. I mean, you have your low points when you question things. You have those times. You know, preaching and thinking about hell all week. Man, that can be discouraging. And you can, you can go down some wormholes on that topic, okay? But God is not afraid of your doubts about your fears or your low points. In fact, he wants to give you evidence to support the fact that you made the best and blessed decision when you trusted Christ and began to follow him. He wants to encourage your faith with evidence. He wants you to continue to live by faith. Okay? So perhaps you're that. Or perhaps you or a friend you know are a seeker or a doubter. You or he or she, your friend, is on the unbelief side of the roadblock. Here's the roadblock. You're on the unbelief side. There has not been repentance and faith in the gospel yet. 
because that intellectual or emotional roadblock is still in the way, right? I want to believe, but oh, I can't, I can't quite get there because this is here. There's a wall here. I need you to help me take down this wall. And you or your friend may even want to believe that Jesus is Christ. Maybe you want the blessing of genuine faith. Have, have you ever heard someone say, I wish I had faith like that? Like you have simple faith in Jesus and you're just sharing things like God's doing in your life and they just look at you like, like you're a stranger and you experience strange things, but they're delightfully strange things and they want it, but they say, I wish I had faith like that. Okay, there are people like that. And, and, and you or your friend, you may want the blessing of genuine faith, you just, you just don't want a blind faith. You, you don't want a faith that believes in spite of evidence. You want a faith that believes because of evidence. And listen, God wants you to have that kind of faith. You say, I don't agree with that. Okay. Why did the writers of the Gospels write the Gospels? <laughs> to give people in the first century evidence that Jesus was the Christ. <laughs> he wanted people to believe because of the evidence. Your faith is based on such things. Okay, not in spite of the evidence. He wants you to believe in him based upon his faithful track record and the evidence that he interacted with many humans in human history for over 4,000 years. How many people are in the Bible? And how many cultures and how many kingdoms and how many places and how many this and how many that, right? So archaeology is a big part of the evidence that the Bible is a reliable historical document. It is part of the evidence that this book is not a pious forgery, meaning it's not some fictional work like a novel written by well-intended religious men to help humans better themselves and maybe make a buck along the way. That's not what this is. It is part of the evidence that this powerful archaeology is part of the evidence that this powerful life-changing book that transcends ages, generations, cultures, and peoples. This is true and reliable, and archaeology is part of that evidence. You have the eternal, powerful, life-changing claims of the Bible that stand on their own two feet and continue to change the lives of those who humbly repent and believe the gospel. One, well, one author wrote this. He said, The Bible as a religious work needs no proof of its inspiration and authenticity. The Bible as a religious work, as a theological work, because it's, it's like viewing history through a theological lens, right? Through a lens of God interacting with human history, interacting with man. He said it needs no proof of its inspiration, meaning that its origins divine, and no proof of its authenticity, that it is authentic. He said this, its truth is timeless, Right? We see that as we study the Bible. It's relevant. I can apply it today. I, I can't tell you how many times we've been studying through this, that, or the other, and I'm like, oh my word, this really applies very specifically to these people right now. I almost don't want to preach sometimes. I was like, this is so specific. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, here we go. In for a nickel, in for a dime, you know. But it's timeless. It's eternally valid. Valid, and that is one evidence of which it is continuing influence on the world culture. It comes right down to the 20th century. Okay, and this was written, this quote, in the late 1970s. So you have these claims that are true, whether people believe them or not. And because those eternal claims are true, because those claims were made on earth throughout the history of mankind, there is ample evidence in the world to support them. You know what that's called? Say this after me, corroborative evidence, corroborative, okay? That is evidence that corroborates, all right? What does corroborate mean? Well, that sounds like punching my brother in the nose. Not quite. Do you have evidence of that, boys? No? Okay. All right? It means to confirm or give support to a statement, theory, or a finding. So it's like this. Daniel comes home with a bunch of candy that a friend gave him. And he leaves it in his room. And he comes back to his room and it's gone. And he knows, he claims, someone stole my candy. He goes to Michael and says, Michael, did you steal my candy? And Michael says, no. He doesn't trust Michael's eyewitness account. So he goes and he looks in Michael's room to see if he can get some corroborative evidence that Michael's telling the truth. 
and he finds candy wrappers all over the place. He found supporting evidence, evidence that, cor- that corroborated the fact that Michael was not telling the truth. <laughs> Michael said, no, I didn't take your candy. But Daniel found evidence to the contrary in his room. That's corroborative evidence. Does that make sense? Are you with me? Okay. So he can test the claim of the eyewitness, right? And he asked another eyewitness before he finds the candy wrappers. He asked Aaron, Aaron, Michael says he didn't take my candy. Did you see him take my candy? And Aaron says, come over here. <laughs> gets away from Michael. Yes, he took your candy. He tells the truth, right? And so he goes to the room. He verifies one person's testimony, but he proves the other one is wrong, right? Because he verifies that Aaron was telling the truth, but he verifies that Michael was lying. Now, this is all hypothetical, okay? Michael would never take Daniel's candy and then lie about it, okay? And Aaron always tells the truth as well. All right, so you, know, you understand what corroborative means, Okay? See, detectives, ooh, detectives seek such evidence all the time to figure out if a witness statement about a crime is reliable. They look for verifying evidence that supports the claims of the eyewitnesses. They, they go and they look for evidence outside of what the eyewitnesses who claim to have seen the crime happen, they look for evidence outside of that to either support what the eyewitness said or destruct what the eyewitness said. It's either support it or deconstruct it. So what do they look for? They look for DNA. They look for fingerprints. They look for other evidence. Okay? What are other evidences, Richard, that they might look for? There's a lot more than that. So they look for corroborative evidence. So watch this. This is important. Here we have an ancient book. Ancient. Claiming to be written about real people, real cultures, real kingdoms, real places, real events with real eternal truth claims weaving in and out of this book and the long history of humanity that it provides. Can we pull DNA or deaths for fingerprints? Nope. This is a cold case. What's a cold case? It's something that happened a long time ago. Long after the eyewitnesses are dead. Any eyewitnesses around from the first century? No. But we can look for evidence in archaeology that supports that the history of the Bible is reliable history. See, if the writers lied about those times and places, if they fabricated information, meaning if they made it up, if they fictionalized things to gain a crowd, this is all just a story of fiction, archaeology would have uncovered that by now. It would have uncovered it. It can't help but do so because the Bible covers a vast section of world history. So as we dig into this planet, we make and have made and will make discoveries about the past in human history. This historical record found in the Bible is supposed to have happened on this planet. If it did happen, you would expect plenty of evidence. And guess what? There is plenty. There is plenty. Now, I want to give you an illustration. Okay? And then I'll familiarize. I'm just introducing you to some of these. And so, you know, I don't want to get to, you know, I don't have my... Well, never mind. I don't have my professor get up tonight, so we won't get all academic. All right. So it's like the evolutionist who claims that all the species of Earth evolved from one species into another over millions and millions of years. Okay, that's, that's, a, hu- that's a huge claim. I, I think about how big of a claim. Like, that's a bigger claim than the claims of the Bible. Like, when it comes to, like, pfft, that's huge. Okay, we're talking millions and millions, and we're talking about macro changes from one species to another? Probably take faith to believe in something like that. Hmm. If it was true about the world, like if, if that was true, okay? Now, I'm not trying to rock your boat. I'm just saying, if that was true about the world, you would expect a vast amount of fossil evidence demonstrating the supposed fact that transitional species existed who evolved from one species into another species. Transitional species, you would expect that there would be evidence of that. The problem is the evidence is not on earth for the transitional species. Okay. Now, they like to point to different things. Oh, look, this one had an extra bone, you know, and things such as that. Now, I might be out of my league in science. Some of you science educators might need... Okay, roll with me, okay? You can help me. Science is coming. But they, the, here's what they can do. Here's my point. They can account for micro changes within a species, right? 
a bird goes to a certain place and its beak adapts because of the seeds or because of this, that, or the other. That's a micro change within a species. Okay? But the evidence is woefully lacking concerning macro changes, macro evolution from one species to another. Now, does that seem to you like the people who hold so tightly to that are believing because of the evidence or in spite of the evidence? Yeah. So do you see my point? It's like this, if I say the Emmanuel Baptist Church members who built this building buried boxes of cold, hard cash all over that field, and you go out and start digging but don't find anything, then the big claim I made is a big lie. It's a big lie. So, since archaeologists have dug all over the globe and found evidence again and again that supports the history that the Bible records, those discoveries act as signposts to the reality that you can totally trust what the Bible says. You can trust that the writers were not writing fiction. They were writing things they were certain to be true. We want to believe what we believe because of the evidence, not in spite of the evidence. Isn't that what Jesus wants us to do? So the question, does archaeological evidence support the Bible? And we give that thing a resounding yes. Now, let me tell you what we cannot do, and then I'll introduce you to some of the references here on your sheet, okay? One, can we go to all the archaeological digs in the world personally and look at them? No. I mean, go buy your Indiana Jones hat and buy a whip, but you're not going. That's all you can afford, okay? Who has an Indiana Jones hat? All right, who has a whip? We'll put them together and we've got the man right here. There you go, okay. But we can't do that. Um, Can we spend years upon years of our life getting an education, prepare to be an archaeologist in order to go study the digs? Most of us in the room cannot do that. Now, if one of you young people want to do that, more power to you. Pray about it, pray about it. Um, can we spend the rest of the night looking at all the evidence that archaeology offers? You said, please, no. <laughs> no, we can't. As I said before, these different topics, the manuscript evidence, the archaeological evidence, the scientific evidence, they are like mountain ranges of information. And, and we're going to get into science, and it's a mountain range of information. It's just unbelievable. And so my point is this. If we refuse to believe until we see everything there is to be seen and evaluate all the evidence that there is, we will never believe. Because we'll never be able to see all the evidence. We won't. We are somewhat bound like John was, depending on the reports of others who have seen the evidence. So, let's... uh, Let's introduce some of these things, okay? I'm going to just introduce you to others who have seen the evidence from archaeology that the Bible is reliable. And if you want to spend time with them on your own, then you sure can. I think it'd be time well spent. On your QR sheet, there's a quick reference sheet, I listed J. Warner Wallace first. Now, he was a well-known cold case homicide detective, um, I think in California, okay? Um, he had stuff that appeared on Dateline, NBC, things like that. A cold case homicide detective is a detective who studies murder scenes from decades ago, okay, to try to figure out um, who committed the crime. And he was an atheist for 35 years of his life until, a, he says this, a pastor pitched Jesus in a way I could catch him, all right? said Jesus was the smartest person alive. He's like, that's interesting. And so being interested in whether or not Jesus' claims were true, he began to apply his detective skills to the cold case of Jesus' death and resurrection. He had Christian friends who could give five good reasons, if not more so, why this criminal should be behind bars, but they couldn't give five good reasons why Jesus of Nazareth actually died, rose again, and was the Son of God. So he's like, I need to do some digging. And so he did. And of course, he pursued supporting evidence outside of the eyewitness accounts of Scripture, and he eventually decided the evidence more than supported the claims of Christianity. Like, he's like, I have to believe because the evidence points to Jesus, and he went from not believing the claims to believing that they were true to getting saved. Now, he has a book that is really good. It's called Cold Case Christianity. In fact, kids, he has one for kids, Cold Case Christianity. For kids. Yeah, it's pretty cool. He addresses archaeology in it. 
He also has a website listed there on your sheet, and he has a number of articles that I pulled from the website. They're listed, so you can look them up. And in fact, I have one hard copy of each with me tonight. If you want to come grab one of those and check one of them out and take it with you. But I want to share with you a few things that he said about how archaeology supports the Bible record. Because remember, he used to be on the skeptic side of the roadblock. And he would not believe the claims of Jesus unless he had ample supporting reasons to believe that the claims of Jesus were actually true. So when he saw that the claims were actually true, he accepted what Jesus said about him and his sin. And that makes sense, that that's how that uh, process went. So here's what he offers about archaeological evidence. Okay? First big thing, he says that Christianity is uniquely supported by archaeology compared to other religions. Now, when he became interested in such things, he looked for corroboration related to both the Christian and Mormon scriptures. He had a lot of family that was Mormon. So he starts to consider Jesus. I mean, they talk a lot about Jesus. Not the same Jesus as the Bible, but they talk a lot about a Jesus. And so he's like, I need to check both of these out. He said this, I was immediately struck by the stark contrast between what has been discovered related to the Old Testament history and what has not been discovered in the Book of Mormon. There's a reason for the absence of maps in the Mormon collection of Scripture. Actually, I've been given a Book of Mormon. I have one on a shelf, and I went and looked. There's no maps. There's no maps. Do you have maps in the back of your Bible? Typically, Bibles have maps. I wonder why that is. Okay. He said this, there are no archaeological discoveries of any cities described in the Book of Mormon. Worse yet, there aren't any discoveries of any of the names of characters mentioned in the 1,000 year span of American continental history chronicled in the Book of Mormon. He said this, I don't expect archaeology to verify everything recorded in an ancient book, but I do expect it to verify something. And that makes sense. I mean, we can't dig up everything that's recorded in ancient book, but I mean, at least give me something. The point, Mormonism to him became something, these people are believing this in spite of the evidence against it. And he was coming to the conclusion that I can believe in the Old Testament, I can believe in Christianity because of the evidence for it. That's what he was saying. And what he found as he looked for evidence and support of both the Old Testament and the Mormon scriptures, the archaeological evidence supporting the Old Testament is strikingly different. That's what he found. And you can read more about how he lays out those differences in those first two articles listed on that QR sheet. But the Bible is unique in the factual history it records and the support it has. Now, I want to draw your attention back to something he said that I emphasized, okay? He said this, I don't expect archaeology to verify everything recorded in an ancient book, but I do expect it to verify something. Archaeology doesn't have to verify everything in the Bible, but it should verify something, right? We agree with that. We 100% agree with that. He compared this to seeking evidence in a criminal case that supports the claim of an eyewitness. When, when he does this, when he's looking for a corroborative evidence uh, with a criminal, he does not look for the surveillance video evidence that supports the cl cl eyewitness's claims to a T. You know, you can't always get that. He looks for what he calls touch points that demonstrate the overall reliability of the witness claims. So the eyewitness says, blah, 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 all this stuff. And he goes and he looks for evidence and he finds touch points within that testimony. Oh, I found something that verified that and something that verified that, something that verified that, something that verified that. Hey, that's a reliable eyewitness testimony. In fact, he wrote an article listed, why doesn't archaeology corroborate every detail of the New Testament accounts? Why doesn't it? Why doesn't it support every minute detail of the New Testament historical records? And as you can imagine, critics of the Bible use this to challenge us who claim the Bible is accurate. They say something like, if you can't prove every historical detail to be true, then you must reject it all. Well, if that was the case, we couldn't know anything about any historical individual, <laughs> could we? No, there's no way, okay? So Wallace cites a man by the name of Dr. Edwin Yamachi, okay? And he was, is a historian, Professor Emeritus at Miami University. He wrote a book that's not listed on your QR sheet called The Stones and the Scriptures. If you want to write that down. The Stones and the Scriptures by Dr. Edwin Yamachi. Okay? 
And listen to what uh, this doctor said about archaeology. I've got the quote here, okay? He said, Only a fraction of the world's archaeological evidence still survives in the ground. Just as a fraction, not all of the world's archaeological evidence is still there. Now, why is that? Humans use this earth, don't they? Kingdoms get conquered. Nations get wiped out. Not all of the archae- all of, okay. Not all the evidence is still in the ground, okay? He said, from there, only a fraction of the possible archaeological sites have been discovered. So there are sites out there that people haven't even discovered yet. So keep looking for the city of gold. I'm just kidding. That's a joke. But there are sites that have not been discovered yet. He said, only a fraction have been excavated. And those only partially. So these archaeological sites, only a fraction of them, that means have been dug into and, and taken care of. You know, it's only been partially the ones that have been excavated. Only a fraction of those partial excavations have been thoroughly examined and published. Meaning they looked at all the minute details and then published their findings. And then only a fraction of what has been examined and published has anything to do with the claims of the Bible. Now you say... Well, what what information can we have from archaeology? In that small fraction, there's still a ton. It's amazing how much. I mean, there's 7 billion people on the planet. And there's a ton of people interested in the past and history and archaeology. So that fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, that's still a whole lot of information. It's a ton of information. But what is the point? The point is... We don't have all the information there is to have from archaeology about all the historical details of all history. Not just the history recorded in the Bible. But here's the deal. With the archaeological information we do have, that we still have, per Wallace, it is a robust collection of evidences confirming that the New Testament narrative and the Old Testament narrative is true. We just have a small percentage of information but it is a lot of information and it more than supports that what we believe is true. If you read his article, a brief sample, it's listed there, a brief sample of archaeology corroborating the claims of the New Testament, he introduces you to a man by the name of Sir William A. Ramsey. Okay, Ramsey was one of those legends of archaeology, yet he did not start out believing that the claims of the New Testament were true. In fact... So you have the writings of Luke. What are the writings of Luke in the New Testament? The writings of Luke? Luke, what else? There's another one. Luke, Acts. He wrote Luke and Acts, okay? And he believed, he did not believe that those things were written in the first century. He believed that Luke wrote those later than the first century. Now that's... Significant because Luke claimed to know Paul and Paul exists in the first century. (laughs) And many people, there were many guys who thought, well, Luke can't be accurate and he he wrote late and blah, 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 blah. And so he bought into that stuff. But he was working on a project. He was doing a topographical study of Asia Minor, which is Western Turkey. You say, what does topographical mean? That's a study related to maps and whatnot and the lay of the land and everything, Okay. What this like? He's doing that study. As he did his work, he was compelled to consider the writings of Luke. And much of Luke's writings, specifically Acts, recorded history from what used to be known as Asia Minor, that part of the world in western Turkey. And as a result of studying Luke's writings and doing archaeological digs throughout that area of the world, he was forced to do a complete 180 on his beliefs due to the overwhelming evidence he recovered in his research. And he eventually found himself actually relying on the book of Acts, trusting it as a a trusted friend and guide as he did his work and his investigations in Western Turkey. And he ended up writing a number of books, okay? Then those are listed. This guy's incredible to read. Those are listed there under his name, okay? And he must be considered if you want to explore this. Now, I've also listed a few websites related to this. I have listed two books, that uh, one by the guy named Kitchen on the reliability of the Old Testament. That's a newer book. It was written in the early 2000s. Uh, that book, Biblical Archaeology and Focus, was written by a guy named Keith N. Chauville, and that was written in the 70s. Okay? And flip your paper over. I want to give you a few more to write down, um, give you access to these. Okay? The first one is... 
archaeology in the Old Testament. Archaeology in the Old Testament. And it is by a man, a man named Alfred Horth. H-O-E-R-T-H. Alfred Horth. There's a book called Archaeology in the New Testament. Written by a man named John McRae. Archaeology in the New Testament by John McRae. M-C-R-A-Y. There's a book called Ancient Egypt and the Old Testament. Ancient Egypt and the Old Testament. Written by a man named John D. Curried. C-U-R-R-I-D. Ancient Egypt and the Old Testament written by John D. Currid, C-U-R-R-I-D. He wrote another book called Doing Archaeology in the Land of the Bible. Doing Archaeology in the Land of the Bible. And then there's that Macmillan Bible Atlas, third edition. The Macmillan Bible Atlas, third edition. And those are really good beginner works, okay? So, you get home from a long day's work. Your wife texted you that there's an apple pie waiting for you when you get home. And you don't believe her. But you walk in the door and you smell it. And you walk into the kitchen and you see it. And there it is. And now you believe her. Corroborative evidence that supports that claim. Okay? Now, I know that's different than believing the Bible, but my, my point is this, okay? The best things that we have in life come from this book. The things that help our soul and help our heart. And God wants you to have a faith where it's more than just, hey, I've got apple pie for you. He wants you to smell it, see it, taste it, hear it. He wants you to have the confidence that it is so. And I'm just challenging you. If you're struggling with this particular roadblock, can I rely on the history in this book, Okay? Do some digging. Do some study. You say, I wish you would have shown us some, some pictures of stuff. Well, the projector is going to splash over there. Okay, I don't have any pictures in time. But I want to challenge you. Go study. Go dig for yourself. God wants you to have that evidence.